But I mean, one of the first things that we look at uh, after a catastrophic case is, has, has the, the, the injured party hired a quality uh, you know, lawyer with a good reputation, a good track record, uh, who knows what they're doing? Uh, I can't underestimate the, the difference that a good lawyer makes in the value of a case. It's important that, that when people go out and hire counsel to represent them after they've been in a, in a tragic accident, that they hire the right person. I'm attorney Dave Craig, managing partner and one of the founders of the law firm of Craig, Kelly & Follows. I've represented people who have been seriously injured or who have had a family member killed in a semi or other big truck wreck for over 30 years. Following the wreck, their lives are chaos. Often they don't even know enough about the process to ask the right questions. It is my goal to empower you by providing you with the information you need to protect yourself and your family. In each and every episode, I will interview top experts and professionals that are involved in truck wreck cases. This is After the Crash. Welcome to After the Crash, uh, the podcast. Today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how do insurance companies, motor carriers, other defendants value uh, claims? How do they va value catastrophic injury claims uh, and wrongful death cases? Today's guest is John Trimble, uh, who is a partner with the law firm of Lewis and Wagner. Uh, John is a nationally known and locally known um, uh, recognize, and, and recognized as one of the top lawyers in the country. Uh, John has defended uh, businesses, transportation companies, insurance companies, um, other enti entities in catastrophic type cases. He's handled class actions, bad faith, insurance disputes, uh, government liability, uh, business litigation, as well as other areas. He's also a mediator um, and does a lot of, uh, of alternative dispute resolution type cases and has mediated some of the biggest uh, cases in the state of Indiana. He's handled cases throughout the country. Um, he also handles cases on appeal. Um, he handles cases in state and federal court. Uh, John has won numerous awards. Uh, the most, one of the most recent ones is the 2021 Defense Research Institute, Lewis B. Potter, a Lifetime of Professional Service Award. He's been a super lawyer for years. Uh, more importantly, he's been ranked as number one uh, uh, super lawyer. He's got, uh, been ranked by his peers in the best lawyers in America. Uh, for mediation, insurance law, and defense of personal injury cases. Um, John, uh, more importantly, I think, uh, is a father, husband, and grandfather. Um, and when I think of you, John, I think of um, an excellent attorney, a worthy adversary. But more importantly, I think, I, I think of you as a passionate, honest leader in our profession, uh, and in the community in which we practice. And I really appreciate the fact that you agreed to uh, be on the podcast today. David, thank you. I, I feel the same toward you. So I'm really delighted to be here and honored. Well, I think that um, I, I, just, I talked a little bit about your background. You've, you've won so many awards. Is there anything that sticks out in your mind that you're extraordinarily proud of that when you think of your accomplishment over the years that you think, yeah, you know, that's something I take a lot of pride in? You know, yeah, defending the Indiana State Fair after the stage collapse, killed 70 people and injured 70 back in 2011 was probably a highlight of my career. Uh, more recently, representing the governor of Indiana in a lawsuit against the Indiana legislature over constitutional powers of the governor and taking that to the Indiana Supreme Court is another hallmark. But uh, I'm probably most proud of 41 years of marriage and my daughters, and uh, I've got a daughter who's a who's a lawyer and managing partner of a firm out in California. Uh, so those are the things that matter the most probably. So you and I both have been doing this for a little while now. It, it, has this played out the way you thought it would when you first, when you were in law school over here at, uh, at the IU Indianapolis campus? No, no, it's totally different. Is that right? I'm a small town kid. You know, I didn't come here with any expectations to end up with a national practice. That's for sure. Well, I know you started there uh, at Lewis Wagner back, I think, even when you were in law school, didn't you? I started here as a law student uh, at the end of my first year in law school and, uh, and stayed on. Yeah. Another thing that folks that don't know John, John's mentored a lot of lawyers throughout his career and, and has, uh, has helped guide a lot of attorneys uh, in the profession and, and kind of guide them down the path. He's, he's very actively involved 
at the IU McKinney Law School, as well as your undergraduate school uh, down in Hanover. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, valuing cases. I think that you know this, this podcast is designed for the average person who finds himself in a, in a situation that's, that's uh, catastrophic, that someone in their family has been seriously injured or themselves. And, and they're trying to wrestle with this and they're trying to figure out what to do and how to do it and, um, and, and kind of inform themselves a little bit about the process. And I think one of the hardest things, the thing that I hear the most of, you know, from people is how in the world do you value these type of cases? Um, how do you value a catastrophic injury case? And I think that, um, you know, obviously lawyers, experienced lawyers look at these things and, and have to do that. That's part of what we have to do. As, as well as the uh, insurance companies and the, and the defendant companies. So I guess start off just with an overview of, of what you think about how, I mean, how is this, how from your defense perspective, how are cases valued? Sure. Well, you know, Dave, it's interesting. You mentioned experienced lawyers because I can't tell you how many times I've gotten five or six or eight or 10 experienced lawyers around the table and we, we round table the case either here in my firm or I brought in lawyers from other their firms, you've probably done the same. And you describe the sense of the, the facts of the case and have everybody write a number down or a range down and then have everybody turn them over at the same time. And it's always amazing how experienced lawyers have been doing it for a long time, turn it over and they're all within about 10% of each other. And there might be one outlier, a little higher, one outlier, a little lower, but in general, they're all group in the same general vicinity. So well, we all, the thing that happens, of course, the longer you do it, you just kind of, look at a case and, and, and you can figure out what it's worth. Uh, but I mean, one of the first things that we look at uh, after a catastrophic case is, has, has the, the, the injured party hired a quality uh, you know, lawyer with a good reputation, a good track record, uh, who knows what they're doing? Um, I can't underestimate the, the difference that a good lawyer makes in the value of a case compared to somebody who may not be so good. And so um, it's important that, that when people go out and hire counsel to represent them after they've been in a, in a tragic accident, that they hire the right person. So that's a clear starting point. And, and I don't know if you, how you feel, but I feel um, almost relieved when I see the defense hire a really good attorney. Um, somebody asked me the other day, I was out doing an inspection here recently on a catastrophic semi case. And the defense lawyer that, should, is that the defense firm is not a firm that normally does this. And when he was out there, I could just tell, like, he didn't know what a, a scanner was. He didn't, he didn't know what a, a total station was. He didn't. And so I was like, oh, no, <laughs> you know, because I would rather deal with an experienced attorney uh, than an inexperienced attorney. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know that an experienced attorney, frankly, is going to get a greater value for the case than somebody who's not as well experienced or doesn't have as good a reputation, it's just the way it is. Um, th there's a, a long list of things that go into you know, how we evaluate a case. Of course, it, you, know, you, you can start with what kind of accident is it? How, how uh, severe is it? Uh, you know, what do the pictures show? Pictures, you know, say a thousand words, you've heard that before, uh, you know, is the, uh, are, are cars all crumpled up or are they only lightly damaged? Because, you know, we all know that the, the worse something looks, probably the worse the injuries are. Uh, so that's important. Um, I want to know where the accident happened because I want to know, you know, what county is it going to be tried in? Or is it, is it going to be in state or federal court? And where is it going to be? Because some locations, uh, you know, the jurors put a higher value on cases than they do in other places. And so that's part of the evaluation. Uh, is, it a, is it a clear case of liability on the part of the defendant uh, or not? You know, is it disputed liability? Is the defendant, you know, does the defendant have defenses? Uh, is the plaintiff at fault for what happened? Is some other party at fault for what happened? You know, those have a, have a, a bearing on what the case is worth. Uh, and then, uh, you know, are there any inflammatory facts. You know, has there been drinking involved in the part of the defendant or the plaintiff, drug use, using a cell phone, texting while driving? I mean, you know, there are all kinds of examples of things that are kind of inflammatory that will either drive up or drive down the value of the case, depending on who's the one who was doing it when the accident happened. Um, you, you can't, of course, 
you know, exaggerate the, the, the importance of the injury. I mean, if, if somebody walks away from an accident, isn't treated for two weeks or a month, um, it's going to be harder at some point in time later to convince people that they had an injury. Although we do see cases from time to time where somebody does have an injury, but for other reasons, they don't get it treated. Uh, or it could be a brain injury that they don't get treated. But in, more times than not, we're looking for, you know, immediacy of the treatment. Did this person, you know, did they have to go to the, to the hospital in an ambulance? Did they have an emergency room visit? Um, you know, that's important. Uh, you know, what are the nature of the you know, injury? Day? Are they injuries that everybody would re realize are painful, like burns, um, uh, you know, severe fractures? Uh, are they, or are they the kinds of things that people can't relate to, you know, the soft tissue injury to the back? If you haven't had that, you may not realize how painful a whiplash is, for example. Uh, but but to, so the severity of the injury is important. The age of the person who suffered the injury is important because if it's an injury that they're going to live with for the rest of their life, the younger they are, the more valuable it is. The older they are, perhaps not as valuable. Um, uh, so, you know, so that's an issue. Um, and, you know, did they have to have surgery? Um, how long were they in pain? Uh, what kinds of activities uh, were they unable to do because of the accident? You know, did they miss work? Or were they able to continue working? Um, I mean, we look at all kinds of things, uh, you know, when, when you're trying to really look at the impact that an accident's had on somebody's life. You know, were they able to take vacations you know, within a short period of time or, or, or within the year after the accident, uh, what kinds of activities are involved in. Uh, I know you and I've talked before about social media, you know, what, what pops up on Facebook uh, or Instagram or some other social media site uh, where they're uh, on a vacation somewhere or they're climbing a mountain or they're riding a bike or they're skiing uh, or any number of dancing. Um, you know, you see things that that has a building on value. Uh, so there are just a whole lot of things of that nature that have a bearing on value. And one of the things I hear clients talk about or, or you hear in cases is pre-existing conditions. Sure. Um, you know, does, does pre-existing condition, I mean, I, I suppose it could cut either way, depending on what the pre-existing condition is and what the injury from the wreck is. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we have somebody with a pre-existing condition and a fairly mild wreck, uh, and, and it's really difficult uh, to determine you know, whether the, the wreck caused any new injuries or whether it simply caused them to focus a little bit more on their pre-existing injuries than they had before the accident. Um, but other times, someone may have a pre-existing injury and the wreck makes it worse. And uh, and so, you know, we have claims involving exacerbation of pre-existing injuries, and that can be significant. And, and, you know, that reminds me, I mean, we the medical records are really important. I can't you know, overstate how important they are because, um, you know, doctors and nurses and medical people are trained to try to accurately take down the information that they gather from, you know, the, from the patient and to put it down and get it, get it in the, in the record, get it in there accurately. And so if we, if we get medical records after an accident, we get them either get them from you uh, or we send a subpoena to the doctor or the hospital and get the records, uh, and, the, and the record says the person showed up in the emergency room, they weren't in any pain, they weren't suffering any, you know, memory loss, um, um, you know, they look and feel fine, that's going to be recorded in the medical record. Uh, if, if, uh, if they're getting physical therapy after an accident and uh, they're telling the physical therapist that they, you know, worked, at, worked uh, eight hours in their garden, the day before, or you know, did things those show up in the medical records. So they're, they're, we're looking at medical records to see are they consistent with the story that the person is telling about how they how they've been injured and how the accident has affected them. Sometimes they are consistent. Sometimes they aren't. The um, I think that um, you know there's 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 very few secrets, I guess. Uh, in a lawsuit, um, you know, there may be things that aren't admissible at trial, but as far as the discovery, I think some people, a, client, a lot of clients will ask me, why should I have to give my medical records up? You know, um, but that's, you know, I mean, it, you, it's almost impossible for the defense to evaluate a case without looking at them. I can't imagine you could do it. 
You just can't do it. And and that's, you know, one of the my pet peeves is when I'm dealing with a lawyer on the other side who simply won't cooperate in getting getting medical records to us. Because, you know, part of my job as defense counsel is not just to defend the case. I'm not necessarily trying to minimize the damages, as, as strange as that sounds. I'm just simply trying to verify it. And, and I find that the better defense lawyers are the ones who just simply evaluate the case for what it is, um, you know, rather than straining to, to try to find little things here and there to you know, criticize the defense. But I, I need the medical records and, and then the chips fall where they may. If the records are really good for the plaintiff, well, then they're good for the plaintiff. If they're good for the defense, they're good for the defense. But it doesn't do any good to hide them. And I would think that... Um... You know, I, I think you touched on it that, you know, part of the defense lawyer's job is to continue to evaluate this claim as it develops. And I assume as a defense lawyer, you must have to get give that information back to the decision makers, to the insurance company or to the motor carrier or to the company, the, the defendant. Yes, I do. And and uh, and one thing you know people should understand is, um, is that the process of getting high authority to settle a case is different than it once was. Um, you know, it, it used to be that that a uh, local claim manager for an insurance company had the personal authority to make a decision, you know, up to the policy limits of whatever the policy was, even if it was a million dollars. Uh, and and that has changed. And, uh, and and of course, there really aren't any local claim managers to speak of anymore. That you know, insurance companies have regional offices now and home offices and. You know, we're not dealing with local people as much as we used to, but the, the, the frontline claim representative typically doesn't have much settlement authority, if any. Their manager may not have much settlement authority. Uh, it may go up to a vice president level or higher uh, you know, to get settlement authority. It may be settlement authority that is, that is uh, extended by virtue of a committee meeting, committee of high-level people who decide you know, what, what value to place in a case. And that's time consuming. And that's the that's another point that I try to make to, to my plenty for your friends is you know, get us the information so we can get it to them so they can be evaluating it and get back to us. Uh, because it, it, there's nothing as excruciating as waiting and waiting and waiting to get settlement authority because we don't have anything we need. And I think that's um uh, I guess some advice to to us, like you said, with the plaintiff lawyers, is that um, I mean, it should be a process where we're continuing to update you. Uh, as we go. I, I know our firm changed the way we used to do things with respect to medical records and that we supplement them as we get them. Rather than waiting to be asked, we just continue to supplement them because what we have found is that, again, the lawyer has to take, the defense lawyer has to get them. They have to have their office look at them. Um, then they have to figure out what, you know, what to do with them and then um, and how it impacts the case. And, and like you said, I mean, it cuts either way. I mean, they are what they are. You're going to get them. So why not go ahead and provide them? Um, and then we can fight about what they mean down the road. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, you know, the medical records are challenging. And, and it, you know, to your point about people wanting to know why we need their medical records, there are things about the medical records that people don't think about. You know, they may not realize, for example, that they're that they're that they're suffering from anxiety and headaches and other things, and their medical records actually show that they were suffering from anxiety and headaches before. Uh, they may not realize that their medical records, you know, demonstrate that they have a life-threatening illness that may shorten their life expectancy. Uh, and and you know, you when you're presenting a case to to me, say, hey, John, I'm representing, you know, Joe Smith. He's 35 years old. He's got a life expectancy of 40 to 50 years. But the medical records may show that, that uh, he has a genetic problem. He may have cancer. He may have had heart disease, obesity, a number of things that could affect his life expectancy. Um, so there's a lot in the medical records other than just the description of the injuries that are related to the accident. Can you explain to the folks what, what when we talk about reserves are set, what a reserve is, what that means? And then does that change during the pendency of the case or does it always stay the same? Well, the insurance companies are obligated by statute to put aside uh, an amount of money from their, from their, uh, you know, the money they have on hand to settle claims and reserve it to settle cases. And uh, and so 
they have to use a formula that, that reasonably represents what they may have to pay on the case and everything's said and done. And so they need, you know, that's, that's where we get involved in supplying the, the information they need, try to set a reserve. But, you know, typically they can't settle beyond that reserve. And so if they're not getting the information they need to set a proper reserve, then they're not going to be able to give the kind of authority they need to settle the case. So every company has its own procedure for how it sets an initial reserve. Uh, they, they, they take into consideration a projection of what they think the cost is going to be to, 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 first of all, to defend the case. And we defense lawyers on every case have to prepare a budget. Literally within the first 30 days after we get the case, we send out a budget. We have to update that budget periodically, and that allows them to update the reserves. And then as they get more information, they, they can adjust the reserve upward uh, you know, as they get more information about liability and damages and, and what their exposure is. Um, very good go ahead. Ask us to tell them what their reserve should be. I, early in my legal career, you know, they would ask us, you know, what do you recommend to reserve, reserve on this? But they don't do that anymore. So, and, and I think that you, I think on the catastrophic cases, the, the really significant cases, um, uh, that it, it takes, I, I assume it's not easy to change reserves. I assume that it takes time. I think you touched on, it takes time to change the value to, to, to get it up to speed. It's not just one person who typically is making that decision. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. And there's, there's, there's one factor that a lot of people don't think about. Almost every insurance company of any size has what is called reinsurance. And I won't, I won't put you to sleep talking about it, but the ad, a small to medium-sized insurance company, if they have a policy that they've written with a million-dollar limit, chances are their company only has the first 250000 of that, and their reinsurer above them is responsible for the next seven fifty. Uh, and, you know, it varies from company to company, but but uh, so so when it comes to, you know, Selling the case, they don't have to get the permission of the reinsurer. You know, that's the reinsurer doesn't take any control over what the company does, but they do have to, you know, document their file so that they're going to pay an amount of money that is above their own retention and into the reinsurance layer. Uh, there's got to be an explanation in the file sufficient to explain why they paid money that went into the reinsurance level. And, and I know, I mean, I, and, and I know, I mean, I had a case down in Kentucky that was, you know, in, in the, it was a very significant case. And the attorney, right before trial, literally flew to New York and had to meet with a whole committee because, in his opinion, the value had changed. It had gone up. And, and I remember him coming back talking to me and saying, like, this is not an easy process. Um, to do that. Um, and there was a lot of people involved when, I mean, this is in the millions, but you know, tens of millions, but it's, it sounded like to, from, from his thing that it was a big deal and it was not an easy decision. And in fairness to him, it, it takes time to educate people. Well, if you have multiple layers of insurance, you know, if one company has the first million and the next company has the next five and the next company has the next 10 and the next company has the next 25, then you've got to convince every layer that that the that the exposure goes into their layer, and so and and you want to do that as early as possible because and you, and you want to make sure the excess carriers are notified as early as possible that they have an open file that they're gathering information to evaluate their exposure because it makes it terribly difficult to settle a case if you're going to have to get into a higher level of insurance and they're not ready. And, and so in today, and we'll talk a little bit about mediations, but. So most like in most jurisdictions that I practice in, um, mediations are either required or encouraged. Um, and mediations are a fantastic tool um, for my clients because they get to be involved in the process, um, especially on bigger cases than the, the defense is involved and the, the decision makers typically are involved. But how much time before a mediation is set does does the information have to be given to the decision makers for it to actually even be relevant to them? I, I would say with the majority of the insurance companies I represent, 30 days. They, they will want a report from me at least 30 days before mediation. 
because they then have to write up their own report and it has to go through channels. People have to meet. Um, and so minimum of 30 days. And, and what and what role does the defense lawyer, how big a role do you play in, uh, in, in you know, I, and I would imagine it de- depends. Like, you see, my clients rely upon me almost completely because they have no knowledge of the of the value or what cases settle for or what their verdicts are. But you're obviously dealing with sophisticated folks that, that do this for a living. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I if I have a pet peeve with my clients, it is sometimes um, I'll come to mediation not knowing what they're prepared to pay. And when that happens, I can't be very helpful in making recommendations to them about, okay, we should offer this much now. We should make this this much on our second move and so on if they don't tell me. On the other hand, if they do tell me, then I can come in with, you know, understanding, okay, this is how much they're willing to pay. You know, what what can we do to, to either get there or, or not, go, not go beyond what they want to pay? But, uh, I mean, I would say that it's, the reality is they, they don't want me to put in writing what I think the case is worth. They don't want that in their file because if things go badly, they don't want that in there. On the other hand, I want it in there because uh, I want to be on record that I've told them what I think the case is worth. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I I do find a way of making sure that my clients have some idea what I think the range of, of the exposure is in a case. Uh, and, and usually it's, it's conversations these days, it's Zoom meetings. It's not unusual to, to have you know five or six people on a Zoom meeting uh, where I provided a report and they ask questions about it and then we talk and then I get off and they and they meet. And I would assume that if a if a company is hiring someone like yourself um, who has a really good reputation who's been doing this for a long time and has a very good success rate, um, I would assume that they hire you and are paying you to listen to you. So I would hope that that's a, at least that, that that's happening. That's my hope too. <laughs> Uh, but nowadays, I, I mean, I, I have, I've had cases. I had another one down in Kentucky recently, which was a horrible uh, multi-death case involving a semi. And I, it was through the negotiation process. We mediated the case. All the other plaintiff lawyers settled except for me. Um, and I was going towards trial. And all of a sudden, they, they completely shifted law firms. So the law firm who I thought was providing all the information who I actually thought I was I was worried about because it was a local lawyer president of the bar association. I mean, really good, likable person. All of a sudden, they removed them and brought in a trial firm from out of state to come in and try the case against me. Um, And and I thought, boy, that's you know, that's that's strange in my world. (laughs) I don't typically bring I don't bring in a trial lawyers to try the case for me. Well, is that unusual? You know, it's, it's not that unusual. <clears throat> we we get called in uh, regularly to take over cases where the, the company is not happy with the defense counsel they have or they, they lack confidence in them. So it happens. And, and I wouldn't be honest with you, but I didn't tell you it's happened to me before, you know, where I, particularly on the ones where I've been too insistent with the company as to what I think the case is worth, they didn't agree with me. And, uh, and wanted somebody else. Now, I mean, we, we get together and laugh about it because I can think of one lawyer here in Indianapolis uh, that where he's come in and taken over a case from me or from my partner, Tom, who you know. Uh, and a month later, some other company comes in and takes the case away from him and gives it to us. <laughs> so it, it's, it's one of those things, the first time it happens to you, they, somebody takes the case away, uh, you're, you're upset about it. Uh, and then... Before long, you're thinking, no, you know, I'm relieved because because they weren't listening to me. Uh, you know, it's, it's just as well that they went with somebody else. So I don't I don't really sleep about it if it happens. But it, it's not any fun to take over a case from somebody else and have to get up to speed on short notice. Yeah. Exactly. One of the things that I do uh, with my clients when I, we're talking value is that I try to keep up on jury verdicts and I try to look and see. I, I look at my own stuff. But I also look and see what's happening out there in the in the world around us. Uh, how, how important are jury verdicts to the defense? They are they're very important if they 
involve a jurisdiction where the case is pending. To give you an example, you know, and, and we have clients all the time who want us to do jury verdict research. But if I'm handling a case here in Indiana and they're trying to compare the case to something that was tried in Chicago or Los Angeles or Miami or someplace else, that's not that's not comparable. But if I've got a comparable case from Kentucky or central Illinois or central Ohio, some other place where in general the jury verdicts aren't a lot different than in this area, then yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll look at those verdicts. But you know, the ones that are most important and we do look at them are the ones here in Indiana. And I think that's a great point. And I and I and, and unfortunately sometimes I talk to plaintiff lawyers and they don't really take that into consideration, is that before I file a lawsuit. Um, we look and discuss where can we file this lawsuit. Um, and in fact, I mean, I have a, a, a trucking case out in Iowa and I focus group it before I ever file it because there's an, a unique issue in that case. And I have three, I got, you know, three different places. I can, I, I can file it in Georgia. I can file in Iowa. I can file, you know, and so uh, and not only just, you know, certain you know jurisdictions within Georgia, certain ones within Iowa, certain ones in Illinois. And so, you know, we take it and we'll focus group that issue just so I can hear what people in those jurisdictions think of that issue. Um, And because it's, it makes a big decision because the value of the verdicts are definitely different in each one of my things. And I, sometimes people just file suit where the wreck happens uh, without giving a whole lot of thought, but it it sounds like it from the defense side, you do look at the jurisdiction. We definitely look at the jurisdiction. Um, because, you know, sometimes a lawyer will file something somewhere where we think, OK, we ought, we need to move this someplace else or we want to stay right where we are. <clears throat> and, and so it's not the least bit unusual for us to do the same thing you're doing is either a focus group or, I'm, or I call a local lawyer friend in that community and say, hey, here are the issues. You know, how are the judges for this case? I just did this last week where I'm looking at, you know, deciding between Louisville and you know, in state court or federal court in Louisville. For this particular issue that I've got to file, and uh, we do it all the time. Yeah. The, the um, uh, with respect to uh, mediations, um, how you know, I, and I know you're a mediator, so you're a little, probably a little biased. Uh, but talk to the the folks that are listening to this about the role that mediation plays um, in getting cases resolved and and how it can impact uh, the, the the plaintiffs. Sure. Well. The first thing is, as a starting point, genuinely requires everybody to be ready. You know, you know, it's one of those things where no matter which side of the case you're on, you can't evaluate the case and settle it unless you know what your risk is. So that means you need to have enough facts to know whether a jury's going to go high with this case or whether a jury's going to go low with this case. And so you've got to be ready for mediation. Uh, that's that's the first point. The second point is is that in mediation, that's really what you do the entire day on in either room, is you're talking about okay, what's our risk? What's our risk of turning down an offer that's being made to the plaintiff, and then the plaintiff having to spend a bunch of money on expert witnesses and trial depositions and exhibits, time away from work and family. And going to trial and getting less, or being the same amount of money that they were offered, but having spent money so they, they, they pocket less. And from the defendant's perspective, what's our risk of turning down an offer from you and spending all the money and time going to trial and paying more? So that's what the mediator does: is have that conversation in both rooms, uh, and and it, it's also a time where the mediator is able to talk in both rooms about difficult subjects because sometimes and, and i don't i wouldn't say this is true of you because i know you so well there's certainly some plaintiff's lawyers who, who are friends of mine who, who don't have the courage to tell a client just to, for example to tell their client joe i hate to tell you this but you're not going to be a likable witness in trial the jury's just not going to like you you're a good great person you were injured uh, but, you know, that's a factor that could have a bearing on value. But a mediator can have that conversation. Uh, a mediator can talk to a, a, an insurance company person and really question the position they're taking 
and why they're evaluating the way they are and and maybe draw more money out of them that way. I mean, so it, it's, it's helpful for that mediator to really be able to talk to both sides and help each side recognize what their risk is so they can come to a number that both parties can live with. One of the things that, that I've utilized, and, and I think, you know, even with cases with you, um, are videos um, that kind of show um, some of the witnesses that I'll be putting on the stand, um, how they come off. Um, sometimes I interview doctors um, to provide information. Um, and I think you touched on it a little bit earlier that photographs, visual things might help. What, how helpful, if at all, um, do you do you think that videos, settlement type videos are for the decision makers? Um, I think they're very helpful. Uh, the, the only challenge that we have at times is, for better or for worse, the actual decision maker is not in the room with me when I come to mediation on behalf of the defendant. You know, I may have, I mean, it, and it depends on the gravity of the case. I mean, if I have a really severe case, then the company is going to send a, a much higher level person. Uh, but if it's but if it's not terribly severe, they're going to send a lower level person who may have roundtabled this with, with more senior people. And so it doesn't do a lot of good to show that low level person that video uh, on the day of the mediation, because even if they're convinced by what they see, they're not in a position to communicate it to the people upstairs. Uh, so sometimes having you know, that information in advance is, is appreciated. Um, and, and, and you've seen it happen too, where we, we go to mediation and the low level person sees the video, realizes they don't have enough authority. And after a while we adjourn the mediation and come back you know, so they can share that information with the people upstairs. And I've done that many times, you know, where I've said, okay, can I show this you know, to, to other people? They need to see this, you know, personally. Yeah. And, and we've had it, we've, you know, we've done that many times. And I kind of had the position, and I think I was wrong. Uh, my wife will tell you I'm wrong a lot of the times. Uh, <laughs> and occasionally I'm even brave enough to admit it. Uh, but, you know, my position always has been, you know, they let the on a bigger cases, let the other side value the case um, and, and get the, the, their value and then go into mediation, not with the intent to settle, but with the intent to inform them that the case has a higher value than probably what they set. And using the video or other things uh, to try to do that. Um, now, when COVID hit, um, I couldn't do things the way I used to do them. And so now we were presented with people all over the country and they could participate and we could play the video. Um, and and I probably because you and previously <laughs> told me that it doesn't do any much good to show it right there on the spot. Um, I'm out of the opinion that we try to provide it 30 days ahead of time if we can uh, with limitations and we still put some restrictions on it. Um, but I think that, you know, it sounds like for it to be the, have the most impact, it needs to be given to the decision makers, the attorney, so they, the attorney can give it to the decision makers 30 days before the mediation. Would you agree with that? I would agree completely. And I think of a couple of cases I've had recently where getting a video in advance of the decision was really impactful and made a difference in how they saw the case. Because, you know, we don't videotape. I mean, I know you videotape a lot of depositions, but these days, the insurance industry doesn't always want to spend money on video. They're short-sighted. Uh, but they don't get to see the plaintiff. They have to rely upon our statement. This person makes a good appearance, or this person is an average witness, or this person is a really bad witness. Uh, and, and so... Uh, I'd prefer to have a video of the deposition for them to see it themselves, but getting to see a video of a good witness and good, and good with good family members and witnesses and doctors and people around them can be really impactful. Yeah. One, of, one of the things that, um, and we do, we my firm, we video every deposition and I would prefer to eat the cost um, if I need to at the end. I, that's the great thing about being the plaintiff's side of it is that I can just write off the expenses and, and eat it. Um, and I would rather my, I'd rather err on the side of preserving something. I, I'd never want to be in a deposition where I wish I had videotaped it and I hadn't. 
Um, I heard many times I videotape a deposition and think, well, that wasn't necessary, but I would much rather have that err on the side of being cautious. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, as you all know, these days, the things we can do with depositions where you can line up the transcript with the, with the deposition and you can show clips in court with the, the person testifying, answering a question with the typed answer underneath it at the same time they're answering it can be really impactful too. So there's a lot of good use for depositions, videos for that. Yeah, we, we can't always sell that, but we try. So the plan side, I know at least with my firm, you know, I use focus groups pretty regularly. Um, and I actually do focus groups just to determine how do I change the value of a certain condition, for example. So maybe I have a traumatic brain injury with no bleed and no C positive CT scan. And so I look at those and say, well, how do I want to educate myself and what people think about those? So I may do a whole series of uh, focus groups, not on a particular case, but on a particular issue. And then we try to learn from that so that I can do a better job communicating to jurors. Um, and that helps my value. Um, I find that we do a better job when I listen to jurors or, or enough, get a big enough sample size. Does the defense do focus groups uh, and a focus group for those people listening or when you get a group of people from the community, a similar community into which your case is, and then you present the facts or issues and then let them help you and, and tell you what kind of problems they have with it or what, they, what their thoughts are. Does the defense use those? I know the, certainly uh, my firm and some planning firms do. We do. We absolutely do. I mean, if, if, if we got a big case um, where we have an, an, you know, an issue or two or three, but we're just not really sure how well that issue is going to go over, uh, it's really important. And uh, we're, not, we're not always that focused on what dollar figure the group comes up with. We just want to know, you know how how they see it and whether they would find force against or against us on the issue. And, uh, you know, we, we like the, the, the mock jury trial where we, where we give them witnesses, give them evidence, uh, give them argument, put them in a jury room. Uh, and we can watch through, you know, through a, uh, through either a camera or through a glass window, a mirrored window and listen to the deliberations. And, uh, we learn a lot from that. And, uh, I have you know, lawyers here in my firm who, who, who actually have a practice where they will, they're, they're available for hire to go do mock jury trials for people who want to have a mock jury trial. And our guys will get up to speed and, and go play the role of the plaintiff to play the role of the defendant and help, help do a mock jury trial. And I agree. I mean, we do those as well. And I don't find that I don't rely on the value that they give us, but I do think it had an impact on my thought of the value based upon the issues that are there, whether that's a bigger issue than I thought or a smaller issue than I thought. I had a case recently where we really thought that we had a decent liability defense. Uh, and uh, we put it to a mock jury and to, you know, we, we, we had originally, I think 20 people listened to all the evidence and looked at everything. We divided into two groups of 10, both groups found liability. So we knew then, okay, this case of liability, of course, the person who, who we thought was at fault for what happened to him died as a result of it. So, I mean, it was a big case. Yeah. But, but uh, our liability defenses did not persuade anybody. Well, one last thing from the plaintiff's perspective. A lot of times we look at these cases and we believe the defense is dragging a case on, that, they're, that they want to like the, keep the money as long as they can hold on to it and, and not give it to our clients or certainly our clients suspect that. Um, is that really the, is that the way that it works on the defense side? Well, I mean, the reality is it's not. Um, there, there is a, there's an interesting concept. It's called metrics. And whether you realize it or not, when you go, when you drive through Arby's from the time you order at the drive up until you get your food at the window, Arby's is measuring the time between the order and the time that they take your money. And, uh, and, and they're doing that for the, by store. They're doing it by each person who works the drive up window that they're doing it by order type. And uh, McDonald's does the same thing. Starbucks says the same thing. Uh, you may not realize that when you go in a doctor's office, um, the, the doctor 
walks in and these days they turn to a laptop computer and they log in what time you came in, they log in what time they, they went out and they measure how long they spent with you. And they measure that by, by age of client and by type of diagnosis. Well, in our business, uh, I have metrics and they measure my, my cases by how long the case is open, how much money I spend per case, uh, how much how much time I spend at the beginning of the case gathering the information, how quickly I get it to the point to be ready for settlement. There, there are 360 measures of the performance of defense firms and defense lawyers. And, and our repeat business is dependent upon having better metrics than the guy down the street. So we're incentivized actually to get in and get out. And, uh, and, and the insurance industry realizes that the longer they stays around, the more expensive it gets. So it's really not true. Now, I won't tell you that there aren't some little defense firms out there with a lawyer who doesn't have enough to do, who wants to run up a bill and get paid before they let go of the case. But those people don't survive very long in this, in this market. Yeah. And, and I saw that, I mean, in the trucking world, I mean, I do a lot of trucking cases uh, throughout the uh, throughout the country, but mainly the Midwest. And I've seen smaller firms sneak into the market, grab a bunch of business, and all of a sudden I'll see them and they'll have, you know, I'll go do an inspection, for example, and there'll be two defense lawyers there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not unusual to see one, uh, but it's very unusual to see two. Um, and then that's, and you start seeing delay, delay. And I've seen them within a year and a half get their files pulled and then see other firms that I know that are good trucking defense firms take over the business. Yeah. I assume that has to do with the metrics. I assume that has to do with, with that. Yeah, it sure is. Was there anything else that you think that, um, that the you know, folks that have been injured, uh, seriously injured, or, or, uh, uh, should know about how the defense values these cases what the plaintiff lawyers should be doing differently uh, to help the help the defense lawyers um, uh, to value cases, and it's kind of funny that you know when when I talk to clients, you know, is that uh, I have the utmost respect for most defense lawyers. Um, I actually think that they're doing a really good job. They have we both we both have a job to do, um, but I find most defense lawyers. I have a lot of friends on the defense side probably more on the defense side because I spend more time with them than I do the plaintiff side, except for conferences and those type of things where I'm on the boards or whatever. But, um, but I, it's not, a, it's not a hate, you know, and, and doesn't have to be a, a sh situation where your adversary is in a, in a nasty or, you know, non professional way. And I think sometimes clients uh, for, don't see that because they, it's the first time they've had it, but is there anything else that you think that they should know about the value or how to value cases? or how to give value? I, I mean, I would say this. Because of the internet age that we live in, and because of the cable news age that we live in, if you turn on cable news, if you turn, if you get on the internet, you're going to see big verdicts here, big verdicts there. You know, you see all kinds of reports of things, but they don't necessarily represent what's going on where you are. And so we all live in a news cycle where we, we judge what's going on in the world by what's what's on TV and what's on the internet, where what's going on close to home is totally different. And so I tell people, hire a lawyer that you trust and respect and listen to them and, and listen to their advice because they know what's going on locally. They, they evaluate cases for a living. And yeah, somebody may have gotten a million dollars for, for what, for a similar case, you know, in New Mexico or Texas, that may not be what the what the law is in Indiana. What would happen in Indiana? So don't don't spend a bunch of time going online trying to figure out what your case is worth. Trust a lawyer to help you figure out what your case is worth. One last thing I've always been curious about is 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 my firm. I don't I don't force my clients to settle, and I don't force my clients to go to trial. I just give my advice, and then I'm happy to do what they want. Um, does it make a difference on the defense side, on the insurance company side, if there's a law firm? Not all law firms go to trial. Um, you know, uh, we try to we do. We just finish the trial. But does it make a difference at all um, when an insurance company is evaluating a case whether a case firm actually goes to trial or not? It absolutely makes a difference. No question. 
Yeah. So, so if somebody's seriously injured, they at least ask that question. You know, what, have you go? Do you go to trial? When was the last time you went to trial? I would suspect. Yeah, because I can. Uh, I won't name any names here, uh, but I can. I know some firms who who are very high profile uh, because you see you see their name every day, and who, who don't try cases. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, you know, in the trucking arena, everybody wants truck cases, so everybody's out there looking for truck cases because trucks can cause bad injuries. Uh, but but uh, you got to know how to try a truck case, and there are people out there soliciting truck cases who never tried a truck case. Yeah, yeah, and we've and I, and I've seen that, and and certainly with truck cases, they're so much more complicated. You guys have a whole division of attorneys that handle truck cases. Uh, my firm, you know, we, we handle truck cases. Uh, I just took my lawyers out to Montana to drive semis. And so they are all out driving semis because, you know, quite frankly, um, I don't think all bad, all truck drivers are bad. I think most of them are really good human beings that are trying to make a living and protect their family. There are a few bad ones, just like there are a few bad attorneys. Those few bad ones, unfortunately, can cause a lot of harm. But the greatest thing was we went out to Montana and spent time with truck drivers and drove around trucks on the highway and, and you re- learn to respect people. And then I think that that's true with anybody. You know, you try to learn to respect and, and listen and, and learn from the other side. Um, and I see too many, I mean, it's just the insurance coverages on trucking cases uh, are so much more complicated than a, a car, car case. Um, who insures the trailer? What other, you know, the, is there a shipper? Is there, I mean, so many different parties could be involved um, that I would certainly think that having a lawyer who knows that stuff adds value uh, versus someone who doesn't. No question. no question. John, any last remarks that you would like to make? No. All Thank right. Thanks for inviting me. It's, it's always a pleasure. And, and, uh, um, and I, I hope that we've uh, shared some information today that people will find helpful because that's, uh, you know, we want our profession to be as transparent as possible. We want people to have confidence in it. And the only way to have confidence in it is to trust the people who are part of it. I agree. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thanks, John. Thank you. This is David Craig, and you've been listening to After the Crash. If you'd like more information about me or my law firm, please go to our website, CKF. LAW.com. Or if you'd like to talk to me, you can call 1 800 Ask David. If you would like a guide on what to do after a truck wreck, then pick up my book, Semi Truck Wreck A Guide for Victims and Their Families, which is available on Amazon or you can download it for free on our website, CKFLaw.com.